what I want to do in this session is I want to talk about uh, how, how do you design applications with uh, functional programming. I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about what is functional programming. We'll talk about some of the uh, underpinnings of functional programming. We'll talk about uh, some of the variations you may notice when you look at code in different languages. And, and then we will circle back to this concept of, OK, we see what functional programming is. But if, we weren't, if you're going to be designing applications with it, uh, practically, how can we achieve uh, some of these goals? Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to simply uh, you know, throw our hands up and say, this is how we should be building applications. But a lot of times, practically speaking, we may not be able to connect those ideas to what we want to implement. And we'll see how we can you know, do some of those. We'll also draw some inspirations from uh, examples that are out there that can show us how we could probably uh, make use of some of these uh, techniques as well. Uh, so with that said, let's get started. So the first thing I want to start with is, uh, before we talk about you know, designing applications, we'll talk about what does it really mean to use functional programming. Uh, the very first thing, of course, before we jump into functional programming, is we'll talk a little bit about the imperative style of programming. So what is imperative style of uh, programming? The imperative style of programming is where we take our time and effort to tell what to do, but also to tell how to do it. So for example, taking a, a, a simple example here, if I have numbers, let's say in this case, is equal to, let's say, list of, uh, list of numbers, let's say 1 to 10, we want to start with that. And, and what I want to do here is I want to say, uh, you know, uh, find the double of, let's say, a double of, uh, uh, let's say, a double of um, uh, even numbers uh, in this collection. So you might start with maybe along the lines, you could say integer, you know, i is equal to our element coming from the numbers. And you might say, for example, uh, in this case, if element mod 2 is equal to 0, well, that tells us the number is an even number. We could say result plus equal to element times tw uh, twice, where you could say the result is going to be a variable, which is 0 to begin with. Then, of course, in this case, you can output the result of that particular operation. But this is imperative style. Why? Because it's an imperative style. We call it imperative style because we uh, tell what to do and also how to do it. So that is why this is an imperative style of programming. And in imperative style, you tell what to do and also how to do it. In other words, one of the, uh, uh, you know, this is, of course, one of the key things to keep in mind is uh, very uh, familiar. So almost any programmer in the world knows how to write this code. They are used to it. Uh, they are fairly comfortable with this. But what you need to keep in mind is uh, familiar, uh, you know, you could say uh, familiar is not equal to uh, simple, not, uh, you know, not always especially, right? So we may, we got to be very careful when we use words. If somebody tells you that's a simple for loop, you need to remind them that's not a simple for loop, that's a familiar for loop. And, and sometimes people look at something and say, oh my gosh, that's complex. And I always ask them, is it complex or is it unfamiliar? And they would think about this and say, well, I guess it's unfamiliar because I'm not used to it. Well, if you are familiar with something, you might be tempted to think it's simple, but it's not, it may not be. When you are unfamiliar with something, you might be tempted to think that it's complex, and it may not be. And, and we don't have an ability to judge its simplicity or complexity when we are unfamiliar with something. Uh, for example, most of the city signs on the roads I'm unfamiliar with, that doesn't mean it will be rather uh, very insulting for me to tell you that these things are very complex. You're going to laugh at me if I say it, right? Because it's not something I'm familiar with. How can I make a judgment on what I'm not familiar with? So, so don't confuse familiar with simple. But one of the biggest challenges with this is that details, uh, details are on your face. So you come into this code, and what's the code saying? I will tell you everything about it. 
I will tell you how to go through the elements. I'll tell you how to iterate. I'll tell you how to compare. I'll tell you how to uh, multiply this and how to store it. And every detail is given in this code. It's on your face. You have no escape from it. Here is the best way to think about this code, in my opinion. This code is like that uncle that every family has. You know who I'm talking about, right? You're in a family gathering, you come out of the room, and at a distance you see that uncle. And you're like, oh no, the last time I said hello to him, five hours of my life got wasted. I'm going to take this route and escape from this room, right? And, and that's kind of what this code is. It would bring you down with details and show all the things. That's imperative style of programming. What we want to think about is declarative style of programming. So what is declarative style? As opposed to imperative style, so this is imperative style. That's what we talked about. So imperative style. And as opposed to imperative style, what is a declarative style? So de a declarative style, uh, so let's try this again. So declarative style is where we tell what to do uh, uh, what to do, but not how to do it. So declarative style is where you tell what to do, but you don't spend the time telling how to do it. So the benefit of this is less accidental complexity. And, and the code reads, if you will, uh, reads like the problem statement. So you can quickly look at the code and say, yeah, I understand what the code is doing. The details are given to you. So we delegate the how or the low level, if you will, details to other functions. So essentially, in this case, you are saying, I don't need to know how to do these things. I'm going to delegate that to these other functions. So these other functions can do the work. I can focus on what I am doing. So let's think about declarative style for a minute. There are some good examples of declarative style. There are scary examples of declarative style as well. Let's think of a good example of a declarative style. I would say cascading style sheet is an example. When you look at a cascading style sheet, what do you say? You're saying, if this is the type of the class or an ID, I want you to apply these kind of styling on it. You don't write code for CSS, right? You are providing the declaration of the transformation in CSS, and you're saying, if it is this, I want to be applying that particular transformation. That is an example of declarative style. A more of a scary example of declarative style is XSLT. Uh, if some of you may remember from back in time, an XSLT can be very scary, but it is still nevertheless declarative in nature, and you can provide it. Uh, in a way, if you want to compare this to life, you could say imperative style is like driving a stick shift car around the town. Uh, I'll admit to you, you will never catch me do that. I'm not going to be driving a stick shift constantly, messing with the uh, you know, uh, things. I just want to get where I want to go. I, these days, I simply get into a car, uh, Uber or uh, you know, Lyft, and say, take me to this address, and I'm done. I tell them where to go. I don't need to worry about the traffic or the driving or the act of getting me there because the driver is going to take care of it. I tell where to go, they determine how to go, right? And that is the key. I tell them where to go. I don't want the driver to take me some other place. And this sometimes happens, depending on where you are, right? I was in Poland. I got into a taxi. I said, Good, take me to this hotel. And the driver said, I've got some ideas for you for places you can go to. I'm like, no, right? You're going to take me where I want to go. I'm not going to go to places where you want me to go. And on the other hand, in a lot of places, they would say, which road do you want me to take? Should I take the toll road? Should I take this one? And I always politely tell them, with all respect, I don't care which road you're going to take. Take me there safely. That's all that's important to me. I'm going to focus on just doing my work in the back seat while you drive me where I need to go. So that's like a declarative style. You focus on results, not on the methods to get there. So, so we talked about these two, and you may wonder, why talk about declarative style in this particular case? So this is where we talk about uh, the, uh, what is called the higher order function. Before we talk about higher order function, let's talk about this. One question, one, 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 let's talk about functions. When it comes to functions, we can uh, pass objects to functions, right? We know this. Similarly, we can, we can create objects uh, in functions. 
Likewise, we can, uh, we can also say we can you know, pass, we can create, we can return objects from functions as well. Now, that's what we typically do for functions. But on the other hand, you can say we have what is called a higher order uh, function if we can pass functions to functions. We can create functions and functions, and we can return functions from functions. Those are called as higher order functions. So higher order functions allow us to compose functions using other functions, and that's what are called higher order functions. We'll see why we are talking about higher order functions in just a few minutes, but, but when you write functions, you can think about the ability not to just pass data to functions, but to be able to pass functions to functions. This is where people often call this as a code as data, meaning just like how you can pass data around, you can pass code around as well. You know, here's a silly analogy, let's think about it. Imagine we are sitting around a dinner table, we're having a good meal, and while I'm having my food, I might lean over to you and say, could you do me a favor, can you please pass that pepper shaker to me, because I really like to spice up my food. So you may lean over and take the pepper shaker and give it to me, you gave me an object at this point, where the object is the pepper shaker, which I'm gonna put pepper on my food. But as we continue to talk, you may say, well, I make this kind of food, and I may say, oh, really, that sounds really interesting. Could you give me a recipe to do this particular, make this food? And you may take a piece of paper, you may scribble the recipe on it with instructions on it, and you may give me the recipe. What did you just give me? Well, you gave me a bunch of instructions, isn't it? And the instructions tell me, hey, take this stuff and soak it in water, leave it there overnight, and you're telling me the steps to follow to make this particular food. So what you gave me is instructions, or what you gave me is a function. So you can either pass a pepper shaker an object to me, or you can pass an instruction or a function to me, and that's basically the idea of passing things around. But before we go further, I do have to apologize to you, because one of the things I really like is what are called dad jokes. And dad jokes are amazing, because children hate dad jokes. And one of the things, a mission of a parent is always to embarrass their children especially in front of their friends. So anytime I'm around my children, I always tell dad jokes and they cringe. But I miss my children right now. They're not here in this, in, in, anywhere nearby, so I gotta find friends to tell dad jokes too. So I'm gonna bring you in on it. So don't hesitate, don't worry about being right or wrong, and I want you to tell me the first thing that comes in your mind. I want you to shout out the answer, right? The first thing that comes to your mind, all right? Are we ready? All right, I'm going to rely on you to do this. What is the most favorite animal of a functional programmer? They want a pet. What comes to your mind? Shout it out. A cat, okay? Elephant, my goodness. Okay, elephant. Camel. Hey, okay, oh, camel. Ooh, now you're getting somewhere. M mouse. I was expecting somebody to say Python. I'll tell you what it is. Good answer so far, no, except the elephant. How about lambda? So lambda expressions, right? So what are lambda expressions? I apologize already for the joke, right? So lambda expressions are anonymous functions. That's what they really are. So what is a lambda expression? So a lambda expression is an anonymous, uh, so anonymous uh, function. So what is an anonymous function? So typically a function has, uh, we can say, a name. It contains uh, typically a return type, right? You have a return type of a function. You typically also have a, a body of the function as well. And of course, you also have the, how can you forget the parameters of a function? Now, given these four things, right, the name, the parameter, uh, parameter, uh, you know, parameters, and the type maybe, occasionally, and you have a return type and a body. If you have these four things, what do you think the one thing, just picking one, is the most important of these four? 
OK, I'm going to give you a function name and go away. Is it sufficient? The body of the function, isn't it? Because the body of the function is the one that does the work, right? So body of the function is the most important of all those four. Remove body. Three more is left. What's the next most important of these three? Yeah. Now you're working your way backward, right? How can the body get its work done if you don't have a parameter list, right? So you have a parameter list. So a lambda expression has those two things. That's it. It's anonymous. Who cares what the name is? And hey, what about the return type? I will infer that based on the context. So a lambda expression only has two things generally, not all the four. So it doesn't have the name. It's an anonymous function. The return type is often inferred. It contains the parameters that you pass to it and a body of the function. Different languages will use different separators. Some languages will use that. Some languages use that. Some languages use that. Some use a, a backslash, and so on. Uh, and the reason, of course, is very simple. In computer programming, you never be consistent, right? It's illegal to be consistent. If you ever see two designers sit together, they would say, what do you use? I use this good. I will not use it then, right? So we try really hard to be inconsistent, because if it's consistent, it would make everybody's life easy. So they all invent their own symbol. And you can see that this is the symbol used in Java, after all. That's C Sharp and JavaScript. That is Ruby. That's Python. That's Haskell, and so on. And, and so a lot of these are separators between parameters and the body in general, but they use some kind of a convention to convey it. So now that we talked about higher order functions, we talked about lambda expressions, where are we going with this? And the idea really is that what is functional a style of programming? Functional style is declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. So that is the relationship between uh, these ideas. So functional style is declarative style plus the use of higher order function. So in other words, every functional style code is declarative. But not all declarative style code is functional. A cascading style sheet is not functional. It's just declarative, right? So, so if you're using declarative and you're mixing higher order with it, you're tending towards a functional style of programming at that point. So we talked about what a functional style is. And I'm choosing the word a little bit carefully here. This is a term I often use. I call it functional style. But let's go a little further with this. This takes us to what is called the function composition. So what is function composition? Let's get back to this example of code we saw earlier and see how we can benefit from a more of a functional style of code with this one. So what I'm going to do here with this example is I'm going to say, hey, this is the imperative style code you saw in the top. But I'm going to take the same example and say result is equal to, and I want to output the result in the end. But here I say, given the numbers, I want to take the numbers and put a stream on it. The stream gives me an internal iterator. I do a filter, and I say, given a number, I want to return, in this case, a number a mod 2 is equal to 0. So it's filtering out all the numbers that are even numbers, discarding the ones that are not even numbers. Then I do a transformation map. Given a number, I want to return a number times 2 in this case. Then I say, I want to perform a sum operation on it. So I'm going to perform a transformation and get the result of it. So when you look at this particular code, what are we achieving in this particular case? So I'm going to call this one as result 1, if you will. And, and this is going to be the result 2 that I'm going to write over here. So this is going to be the two results that we are noticing right now. And when I run the code, the result of these two operations pretty much should be the same, isn't it? Because what we are doing here is to apply the filtering and the transformation, and the result is exactly the same. But when you look at the code in the bottom, the code begins to read like the problem statement. Given the numbers, get me the even numbers, double them, and total. 
So the code begins to read like the problem statement. But how does this really feel when you read this particular code? You want to think about this as the functional pipeline. That's what it really is. It's a functional pipeline. But you have to be a bit careful looking through this. Look at the word list for a minute, and look at the word stream for a minute. Now, what is a list? A list is like a bucket, a bucket of data, right? Imagine you get a notification from the, I guess, the public works department. And they are telling you, hey, on this Thursday, between 10 AM to 11 AM, or 10 to 2, there will be no water supply in your neighborhood, because we're going to do some work. So they sent you this notification two days earlier, right? So as an adult, what do you do when you get that notification? You complain, that's right, right? You complain, right? That's what adults do. We immediately say, these people, they keep shutting water down. I don't like it. What do you do as a responsible adult? You store the water so you can have water for those few hours, isn't it? So you go to the bathroom, fill all your buckets. You go to the kitchen, you fill all your buckets, and you keep the water ready. So when you don't have water for a few hours, you got a supply. That's kind of a list. List is a bucket of data. That's what it really is. But on the other hand, you have a stream. But what is a stream? Stream is a pipeline. And, and it's a pipeline, but what is the pipeline of? It's a pipeline of functions. That's what it really is. So in your house, you open the tap, and you have water coming through the tap, isn't it? But then from the water tank, which is a collection list, which is storing the water, and you have this pipe that's bringing the water down to your ta tap so you can open it. That pipeline is what a stream really is. But it's a pipeline not of data, it's a pipeline of functions. And you're like, gosh, what does it mean it's a pipeline of functions? Let's think about this a little bit more. Something we are all very familiar with, right? So you have a source of data, we'll call it file. I take the file, and I'm going to say over here a cat file, right? And, and when you take the cat file, you then send it through a grep. Uh, some word, let's say, and then you send it through a sed or an awk command of some sort, and wc minus l, and you do this. Now, I want to ask you this question. When you look at this, give me one word for grep from the functional programming point of view. What comes to your mind? What was that? A filter, right? That's exactly what it is. Grep is a filter. Uh, what about set or arc? What comes to mind? Bingo, map. And what about WC? Redis, awesome, Redis. You see how that maps to what we do, right? So the Unix pipeline is a functional pipeline. And each of these functions transform data they don't mutate data, right? They just transform data. So this concept, you can look at in several places. For example, uh, it's a very cold winter where I live. So we have air from the outside. We take the air, and you send it through a purifier. And the purifier is going to remove the you know, stuff from the air. And we send it to a heater. And then we send the heated air through the rooms. That's a transformation of data. What does the heater do? Heater is a function, right? Because the job of heater is take the input air and send it out heated, raising the temperature. That's a function. Similarly, I can take water. And, and once I take the water, I may send the water through a purifier. Hopefully, it's a different type of purifier. I send it to a cooler at this point. Then I get nice, cool water. Now, what is that? It's a pipeline again. But in the pipeline, what is it? The water comes from the tank. It goes through a purifier and goes through a nice cooling unit. 
and you open the tap, you got nice cool water to drink, right? Or you have air coming from the outside, it goes through a filter, goes through a heating unit that heats the air, and you get a warm air in the winter. So that's basically a pipeline that you're dealing with. So you want to think about this as a transformation of data rather than uh, steps to mutate information. So think of this as the functional pipeline. So a stream is a pipeline of functions. That's what you are dealing with, right? A pipeline of functions that, that you are performing the transformation. So now when you look at this, you have laid out a pipeline right there. So you are saying, I have a filter operation, I have a map operation, and I have a sum, which is a reduce operation. That filter map reduce is the pipeline that we have drawn in this particular case. So you want to think about your problem as the series of transformations at this point with the filter map and reduce. So with that said, you say, all right, that's great so far, but what about the efficiency? Now, when you look at the code, you might be looking at this and saying, you know what, this is all great, this is all beautiful, but what about performance? Now, I'm going to tell you, but look at it. Isn't the code cute? And you're going to say, what about performance? But come on, isn't that cute? Well, unfortunately, Cuteness is not sustainable, right? Uh, I was uh, traveling through uh, Portugal, and one of the users group leaders said, hey, I'll pick you in the conference, I'll drive you uh, from uh, Coimbra to uh, Lisbon, I'll take you in the car, you can go speak in the user group, and now I got this beautiful opportunity to sit next to a user group leader and spend the next two and a half hours in his car, and what do two programmers do when they are stuck in a car for two and a half hours? So we talk about memory management, we talk about garbage collection, we talk about concurrency, and eventually you kind of like, there's got to be more things to talk about than all these things. So there was a moment of a few moments of silence, and then we are driving, and then he says, you got any kids? I'm like, oh yeah, I've got, I've got kids, and I talk about my family. And then after a few minutes I said, what about you, you have uh, kids? And his face brightens up and he said, well, I've got a two-year-old daughter. And I said, well, that's pretty awesome, two-year-old daughter. Uh, that was a long time when my children were two years old. And then I said, so how is it to have a two-year-old daughter? And then he said, it was, it was good. And I said, what do you mean it was good? And he said, well, until last month, she was very cute. And, and I said, OK, and what happened since then? And she said, at 3 in the morning, she got up one day and started singing. And I said, that's interesting. And he said, yes, when she does that the first day. And the second day, she sang at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the third day, her mom and aunt said, shut up, because we want to sleep. And that cuteness just went away, isn't it? That's what is happening to this code, right? The first day you look at it, you're like, hey, that's cute. And two days goes by, that's still cute, until somebody says, how much memory does this take? What's the performance? And you're like, shut up. This is not cute anymore, right? So this is where we have to ask the question, what about the performance? My recommendation is don't fear these things. Don't assume these things. Instead, analyze them. Understand what the consequences are. But also be very realistic. Don't try to throw things away with huge statements. We have to be very, very, very practical, right? So let's think about this a little bit really quickly. If I go over here, this case, I'm going to say constant numbers is equal to, let's say in this case, we have these numbers that you see up here. So now I'm going to say uh, over here, let's say output, and we will say numbers dot, Let's say filter, given a element, I want to say element mod 2 is equal to 0, and I want to print that result. Notice we got a 2, 4, and a 6. Now I say a dot map, and given an element, I want to return element times 2. Notice the result is 4, 6, 4, 8, and 12. Then I say a dot reduce, 
And in this case, I say total comma element, and I'm going to return a total plus the element, and notice that in this particular case, the result is a 24. But what did we learn from this particular example? What we learned in this example is that in this particular code, when I run the code, I got a 24. But if I were to comment this line out and run the code, I get a 4, 8, 12. If I comment that line out and run the code, I get 2, 4, and 6. So what's the moral of the story? We go from one collection to the next, to the next, to the next. And what does that mean? More garbage. Garbage is, so you can say more garbage uh, is, uh, is created then more garbage is collected. So if this was being done occasionally for a very small amount of data, maybe my collection has five elements, 10 elements, maybe even 15 elements. Is this going to be a huge problem? What do you think, realistically speaking? If you're calling it occasionally, right? So yeah, no big deal. It's kind of cute, performance may not be that great, but I don't care about performance in this case. But what if you're dealing with a 3 million pieces of data, and you're calling this about 50 million times, will that be a problem? Probably so, right? So you have to really ask the question, what are the consequences? Now, in such situations, it may not be a big deal, or it is, it depends. But this is where I draw a distinction. That was in JavaScript. But again, don't assume. Evaluate it, analyze it, find out. This one here is Java. So in the case of Java, let's think about this a little differently. What is Java going to do is the question. But to understand this, let's take a slightly different example with this. So I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, and I say 5, 4, and I'm going to change the problem just a little bit. I'm going to say, find the, let's say, find the double of the first even number greater than 3. So I want to find the double of the first even number that's greater than 3. So how am I going to compute that in here? I'm going to make this a little bit more verbose to illustrate the point. So I'm going to say public, let's say, static Boolean is even, say, is given a number. I want to return from this a number mod 2 is equal to 0. Likewise, I'm going to write a Boolean, let's say is greater than 3, and I'm going to simply say number is greater than 3. And then finally, I'm going to also write one more function, and this is going to say integer, we'll call it double it, and I'm going to simply return number times 2 in this particular case. So now that we wrote all these three functions, I'm going to write this in the imperative style. So what am I going to say? Result is equal to 0. And I say for int element coming from the numbers collection. And then I say if the is even of the element is true and is greater than 3 of the element is also uh, true, then I'm going to say result, OK, result is equal to double it of the element you better remember to put the break, isn't it? Because if you don't put the break, you're going to do unnecessary computations, which you don't want to do. And then I'm going to output the result in the very end. This is imperative style code, isn't it? But on the other hand, if I were to say over here, int result 2 is equal to, and I say that it's numbers.stream.filter, and I say, in this case, it's sample is even. And then I'm going to say, perform a map operation. And I say, uh, double it. Uh, and also another filter where I say, is greater than 3. And then finally, in this case, once I find the map, I say, find, find first. Uh, and then, of course, if it's not there, or else, give me a 0. So I can then finally output right here the result 2 as well. When you run the code, the result is exactly the same in both the cases. But if you look at this code, we clearly know what's going on in this function. Only look at this example for a minute. What does the highlighted code do? It evaluates 1. 
Is one even? No, throw it away. Is two even? Yes, but is two greater than three? No. Is three even? No. Is four, five even? Uh, no. Is four even? Yes. Is four greater than three? Yes. Double four and you are done. So how many operations did it do? A total of eight operations, right? So and nothing to do with the result in this case, but it did eight operations. So it evaluated one, two, three, five, and four, but what we know is it does not touch six, seven, or anything afterwards. How do we know that? It's because of the break statement. We quit as soon as we find the answer. Now, when you look at the code in the bottom, what you need to keep in mind is what you're looking at is the syntax. Now, you might look at and assume and say, oh my goodness, what this is going to do is it takes the 10 values and, and taking the 10 values given to it. So here are the 10 values, right? 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 6, 7, 8, uh, 9, and 10. And what does it do? Given those 10 values, it gets me all the values that are even at this particular point. So that's going to be is even, right? So it's evaluating 1, 2, 3, 5, 4. You know, it's evaluating all those values. And the result of that operation is a 2, a 4, a 6, a 8, a 10. And the next one, what does that say? That says is greater than 3, which means you have 4, 6, 8, and 10. And the next one says double it. So you have an 8, a 12, a 16, and a 20. It says find the first one. So we are going to keep the value 8 and throw everything else out. So if we were to do this, how, much, how many operations did we perform? We took 10 values and we evaluated the filter on it. Take a 10. And then what happens? We are doing that is, a, 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 is greater than 3 on the 5 values. 10 plus 5 is 15. And then 4 more, and 15 plus 4 is 9. And then on the 9, we double nine plus, uh, sorry, 19. And 19 plus 4 becomes your 23, right? And then you do one more operation, gosh, 24. So when you look at this, you may assume you are doing 24 operations instead of eight, right? So is that a concern if we were to do 24 operations instead of eight, right? And if I say, but the code is cute, right? It looks nice. It reads like a problem statement. And you're going to say, eh, maybe this is not what I want to do. So the question really is, what's happening in this code? And the answer to that question is, do you need to understand not the syntax alone, but you need to understand the semantics of stream. Streams fundamentally are like my children. And you probably have this experience in your own houses, right? Uh, how many of you have children? OK, the others. You have been a child once upon a time, right? How many of you have been a child in the past? <laughs> wow, some people were just born like the way they are, right? That's awesome. But the rest of us were a child once upon a time. Do you remember the time when you were a child? Yeah, some of us. Look at the ladies. They said yes. The, the men are like, no, I don't want to go there, right? That's how I feel about it, right? I don't want to remember when I was a child. Sorry. Uh, but... Um, my children are like the stream. You know why? My lovely wife will tell my son, uh, he, who is, you know, he has a homework to do. And he, she tells him, hey, turn off the TV. Like no words were spoken, right? <laughs> and she says, turn off the TV. And nothing happened. She says, do your homework. No pen was pegged. She says, Hey, put the trash out. Not a muscle was moved. And she says, I'm calling daddy. And everything gets done. <laughs> right? And I don't know, in your house, it may be the opposite, right? In some places, I always say the parents play the good cop and the bad cop. My wife is the good cop, amazing person. I'm the bad cop. Maybe in your house, it's the other way around, right? The dad's, in her house, dad was the good cop. Mom was the terrorist, 
right? So it kind of changes depending on the house, right? That's okay. You always need that balance in the house, I think. But the point really is everything was postponed until I'm calling daddy. This is what stream is. What is the stream is doing? The stream says, hey, turn off the TV. Nothing happened. Then comes the next one. Put the trash out. Nothing happened. Do the homework. Nothing happened. They can rename this as call daddy, right? Uh, or call mommy, right? Doesn't matter. Whatever, whoever is that one in the house. Now, that operation is called the terminal operation. So in other words, there are two kinds of operations that streams offer. And those are intermediate and terminal operations. So intermediate operations that you have are lazy. Terminal operations, operations trigger evaluation, but minimally. So let's entertain the thought just a little bit in this case. So when I run this code, notice that when I run the code, the result of both is eight, as you can see right there. Now on the other hand, if I go back to this code and I say output is even called and I'm a for and I'm gonna say number, right? Then I say in this case is greater than three called for numbers. Then in the double it, I'm gonna say double it called for numbers, right? So I'm gonna run this code and when I run the code, look at, the, uh, what, look at what the output is going to be in this particular code. Uh, let's see, a Boolean cannot be converted to an int, it is telling me. Oh, of course, sorry, I messed up here, didn't I, uh, as I was writing this. So this is going to be, uh, uh, this is called, and that's going to be the function I'm interested in. Great. So, so what's going to happen in this particular case? Look at the output for a minute, right? I'll, 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 I'll read the output for you. It says, is even called for one, for two, is greater than called for three, and, and so on. I'll make it a little bit easier for us to read this, actually. How about this? So let's go over to the Java code directory where I have, and I'm going to just run, uh, run this right here. Let me make sure I have the code right here. So I'm going to say, in this case, uh, run, uh, run uh, Java right now and take a look at the output there, that's a little bit better, isn't it? So what you're seeing is that is even was called for one, two, and then is greater than for two, is even for three, five, and four, is greater than for four, double it for four, and it says I'm done. This is the imperative style code. What about the functional style code? Did it do exactly the same amount of work, right? It didn't do any extra work. So when you compare performance, you want to look at not the raw speed of execution. What you want to look at is computational complexity. Is the time complexity, is the space complexity similar or different? And in this case, at least what are we noticing? That the time complexity of the two are pretty much the same. So you're like, gosh, what's happening in this particular code? What's happening, I'll tell you what is not happening. Let's talk about what's not happening before we talk about what's happening. I'm gonna get rid of the imperative style code right now so we can keep our focus on just the functional style code alone for a minute. Now, what is not happening is the stream is not running the filter on every single value. So this is something we need to understand. The stream, uh, the stream does not run each of the steps on each of the value. So the stream is not saying, I am going to run the first filter on one, two, three, five, four. No, it's not doing. What the stream is doing is the stream fuses all the intermediate operations into one. Then it runs the values over the fused function, but minimally uh, uh, when a terminal operation is executed. So what it is doing is it takes those three functions, right? The filter, filter, and map, and it mushes them together, and it says it's fused function. It runs it on one, runs it on two, on three, on five, on four, and when you run it on four, what happens? 
So the one, so imagine this is fused, right? That part is one, not three. It says drop one. What happened to one? It exited, right? One didn't come to the bottom. You, you put one, hey, where did it go? I don't know. It never came out in the bottom. Well, put two, that disappeared. Put three, that disappeared. Put five, that's gone too. Put four, ah, look at that. I got an eight. Let's go home. No need to do any more work. Because a find first says, just give me one. And the minute find first gets a value, it, 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 it moves on, right? Again, it depends on the operation, but that's exactly what you saw here. You went through one, two, three, five, four, and exit. The value six, seven, and all these were never touched. So what do we know from this? I am going to say this, that functional style is equal to a functional composition. On the other hand, functional programming is equal to functional composition plus lazy evaluation. So why? If I don't give you lazy evaluation, what's going to happen? You're going to eagerly evaluate your code over and over and over. You're going to be creating collection after collection after collection. And what's going to be the result? Really poor performance, isn't it? And the performance is poor. And if I tell you the code is cute, what are you going to say? Get out of here, right? We don't need code, cute code. We need performance. Because if the code doesn't perform, my company, my boss, my customers are not going to pat me on the back and say, congratulations, your code is cute. It doesn't matter. It doesn't solve my problem, right? They care about solutions, not how you implemented it. At the end of the day, that's what matters, right? So we want functional style. Why? Hey, maybe in these cases, it reduces complexity. It reduces the accidental complexity. But you don't want to compromise on performance. So what it really comes down to is this. There are a couple of things we want to identify. And that is, you want to think about this a little bit further. If you look at this, uh, you know, the blank is, uh, blank, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, is to object-oriented uh, programming as blank is to functional programming, right? So if I tell you I am doing object-oriented programming, what is the most important one thing that makes object-oriented code object-oriented? oriented code. What was that? Nope, not classes. Constructors? What was that? No, not objects. Beyond that. Because classes, objects, abstraction, Plato created this thousands of years ago, right? I don't think he was an object-oriented programmer, uh, object programmer, right? Abstraction exists forever. Encapsulation, yeah, but we had encapsulated functions. I define a local variable. Can you change it within a function? It's encapsulated. You know, I'm not saying they're not valuable. So we covered abstraction and encapsulation. There's only two more. Let's go keep going. Bingo, polymorphism, right? What does polymorphism give us? Extensibility. You can call a method on a reference but the one that gets called is not the one based on the type of the reference, but the type of the object at runtime, right? So polymorphism uh, is extremely important. Well, you may argue, but, but you cannot do polymorphism without encapsulation properly. Sure. But polymorphism is a very, very important aspect. Likewise, lazy evaluation is to functional programming. Take away laziness. We don't have nothing to talk about. That's not functional programming. That's dysfunctional programming, right? You're not going to entertain that. You're like, hey, but, but why laziness is important? The reason we want laziness is the reason is this. 
we want really. So functional programming relies on lazy evaluation for efficiency. Make sense? Functional programming relies on lazy evaluation for efficiency. You take away laziness, what happens? You do eager evaluation. <gasps> I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna run this. Okay, good. I did all this work. Okay, thank you. I'll take the first value, throw away everything else. My gosh, if I knew that you needed only the first value, why would I create everything else? Well, why don't you ask what I need? Lazy evaluation, right? But here comes the next problem. We said it's a lazy evaluation, but in this case, if I took a particular data here, and in this case, if I change a data, right, some value that I create here, equal to something, right? And if I use the some value somewhere here, in the functional pipeline, and then I'm gonna change the some value while the functional pipeline is running. Why don't we talk about this a little bit more? Suppose I say the following, right? I say factor is equal to two, and I say in this case, you know, numbers like this, and I say dot stream dot map element element times factor. And I'm gonna store this into a stream equal to, right? Then I say a stream dot for each. And in this case, I'm gonna say system dot out, print line and print it. So when I run the code, it's two, four, and six. But here, I say factor equal to zero. First of all, when I try to do this, the compiler says it will not work. What does it say? Local variable reference from a lambda expression must be final or effectively final. So the, what is the Java compiler saying? The Java compiler says, don't do it, right? There are only two kinds of programmers, right? When Java says don't do it, the first kind of programmer says, thank you. The second kind called the dangerous one. What do they say? <laughs> they have a villainous laugh, right? <laughs> they roll their sleeves. Let me show you how to do this. Stay away from them. And they will show you how to do it. And with their villainous, villainous smile, they say new int square bracket two, and they come in here and say square bracket zero and square bracket zero, right? So they are like, look what I can do. And they are writing that code. Did the code compile this time? It did, right? And, and they will look at you and say, isn't that awesome? <laughs> right? And look how I was able to get around. I want you to know this. At this point, the Java compiler compiled it. But don't assume the compiler is happy. Because it's looking at the programmer and asking, who are your parents? <laughs> How did they let you grow up like this? Right, because this cannot be a good practice, isn't it, right? This is not the way you want to write code. But I'm gonna ask you a question here. And I want you to give me one of three answers. What is the output of this code? Don't be in a rush. And I give you two, three choices, choice one, Choice two, choice three. And I want you to tell me one, two, or three. Output is zero, 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 or two, four, six, or I have no clue, can I go home, please? <laughs> What's your answer, one, two, or three? three? Three. This is a great interview question. I will put this question and ask the person, what's the answer? If they say one or two, they are fired <laughs> before they are hired, <laughs> right? 
You are hired. Absolutely, Nicholas. Absolutely. Why? The reason is the worst kind of developers you can hire are the people who enjoy Java puzzlers. You know what they do? They create puzzles for you. And they're like, isn't that cool? And you're like, how does this code work? You are taking two days. You're looking at their code. You don't have a clue, right? You don't know why their code works. And two weeks later, that Wednesday afternoon, when the whole floor is quiet, from that cubicle, you get a and they're like, they found it, right? They found how the code is working. When that poor programmer finally understands how the code works, what are they going to do? You think they're going to go walk out quietly? They will turn around and write the next puzzler for you. <laughs> and in the meantime, we have a product to release, which is not going to happen, right? When you write code, it's got to be obvious. So. The right answer is three, I want to go home. When you run it, it's zero, zero, zero. But that's not true across languages. That's why this is tricky. So in other words, what is wrong? What is wrong is this function is not pure. So let's go back to what we talked about. Functional programming relies on Lazy evaluation for efficiency. Lazy evaluation relies on immutability for correctness. So when people tell you, make it immutable, you know what that is like? Going to children and saying, you should eat your vegetables. Like, no. That's boring. Which kid wants to eat vegetable? Nobody, right? So don't go to people and say, you need to program immutability. Like, why? Take a hike. Well, wait, wait, wait. Do you want efficiency? Huh? Yeah. Well, you can't have it unless it's immutable. That's the goal, right? That's the reason. So functional programming re relies on lazy evaluation of efficiency, and lazy evaluation eva uh, relies on immutability for correctness. So the model of the story is you honor immutability. So we want to make the functions pure, no side effects. So what are the benefits of purity? Referential transparency. What is that? You can replace a function with its result. So you don't have to reevaluate it. That's referential transparency. Memoization. You can store the result and give it back to me, right? That's very easy, right? What is 125 plus 7? Anybody? 132. What is 127 plus, 125 plus 7? Okay, this is not working with this team. It, it should be really fast. Did I say the different number this time? Okay, maybe that's why. Well, when the inputs are the same, the output is the same, right? You first time you compute this in your head. Second time you're like, gosh, it's the same question again. Boom, right? I was I was uh, watching a bird show. This was uh, like absolutely amazing. This person calls a person on the stage and says, "Are you smarter than the bird?" And the kid is like, "Of course I'm. This is great with teenagers, right? Are you smarter than the bird?" And like, "Of course I'm smarter than the bird." Okay, really, let's try this. And she, th this lady, throws a number like, "What is 757 times 342?" And the kid is almost fainting. And the bird immediately responds. And, and the kid is like, are you kidding me? And she's like, can we try another number? And she says one more. And the bird immediately responded. And the kid is like, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I quit. Your bird is definitely smarter than me. And she's like, the bird only knows the answer for those, those two numbers, right? <laughs> so that's called what? No, no, it's not lazy. It's memoization, right? <laughs> <laughs> the kid was lazy, right? <laughs> Couldn't do the math. <laughs> That's memoization. Memoization, if the input is the same, the output is the same, right? Even parrots know memoization, right? It repeats back. But that's the whole point. If it's, if it's pure function, you can repeat back. You can have safe concurrency and lazy evaluation, right? Safety because there's no immutability. 
question is, how do we design systems using this? If I tell you, you got to design this with purity, and you're going to be thinking, gosh, how can I design a system with kind of, that kind of purity? How is it possible to achieve? I want you to think about this a little bit differently. In a traditional system, what we normally do is we put the database right in the middle. I'm going to take a little bit longer. So you, you, you're going to put the code right in the, the database right in the middle, right? You're going to put the database right in the middle, and you put functions around it, right? And then what are you saying? I pull the data from the database, I do some work, and I put it back. Well, you are in the center of mutability at that point. Everything is changing. Well, if everything is changing, what is the chance of doing functional style? But instead, let's think about this a little bit differently. What if we think of a, of a ring, right? Think of a ring or a frisbee. Uh, and your ring, you have this little circle, and then you have the circle and you have the tube around the circle, right? So think of a circle of purity and a ring of impurity. So a circle of purity, right? You take your circle, that's the middle of the ring, and, and my finger here is the, is the tube that runs across the ring. So you have a circle of purity. No impurity in the middle. You're not mutating anything. You get the data, transformation, out. On the circle is the impurity. So you're completely inverting your design. You don't put the database in the middle and functions around it. You pull this apart, right? Invert it. Your middle is pure. Your database is on the outside. Your UI is on the outside. Your web services are on the outside. Your microservices on the outside. And now you're saying, I'm going to take the data, and I, once I get the data, I'll send it through the purity layer. But I will be doing transformation of the data. When I get the data on this side, now that I've passed through the pipeline, I've not mutated any data, which means I got a copy of the data. I'll go back and stick it into the database, or put that in the UI. So in other words, you want to think about structuring your application so that your application can have a middle layer of purity and a peripheral impurity. Because if you invert it, you're constantly running into this battle. Oh my gosh, what do I do when I'm running this pipeline? If it's impure, I get wrong results. Lazy evaluation doesn't ask you, do you want to be lazy, right? Functional programming doesn't give you an option. It says, it's this or nothing. Because if I'm not lazy, I cannot give you performance. If I cannot give you performance, you're not going to use it. And if, uh, if you're not uh, honoring immutability, you're going to get incorrect results. What good is it to have a cute code that is performing really well to give you wrong results? That's not going to help you. So from the design point of view, think about this as center of purity, a circle of purity, with a ring of impurity around it. You say, well, how would it feel like to do this? This is one of the reasons I really like learning different languages, different libraries, different frameworks. And I challenge you to take this opportunity. You got to have something to do for a weekend, right? Look at a language called Elm, E-L-M. Elm is a language, and Elm language is Sorry, I'm going to write this here. Elm uses 99.9% .9 Haskell syntax plus a tinge of F sharp syntax. Compiles down to. How do you do that? This is amazing. When I was about to type the word JavaScript, all kind of alarm goes off. Compiles down to JavaScript. I know that's scary, right? That's where the alarm went off, right? They're just preparing you for what's inevitably coming, which is kind of scary, right? This is like you write the code in the cathedral, it runs in the bazaar, right? And, and so this one says, you're writing code in Haskell, you're going to honor immutability, 
But Elm is considered to be a reactive UI programming language. Elm completely changed my view of several things. When I, when I started playing with Elm, I, my mind was blown. I said to myself, how could this be possible? You're writing code with purity, but it compiles to JavaScript, and you're altering the UI without mutating anything. Another example of this very similar concept is Redux. If you're using Redux to transform data as a storage, Redux uses this. When you program with these kinds of systems, it begins to challenge your thoughts, your views. And then you can come back and apply those in your own application design. So take a look at Redux, take a look at Elm, and you will notice how they push all the impurities to the boundaries and keep the center, the circle of purity, and a thin layer of impurity. But it's important to embrace these ideas, then write prototypes, play with it, experiment, and see where it takes you. It's a lot of fun when we are able to think along those lines. That's all I have. Thank you.